This is this is this is. Welcome to a brand new episode, everybody. 442, the My Career Podcast. 2023 is the year you're in right now, unless you're listening to this next year. I don't know. I'm not going to be that crazy. Let's just, let's move on. <laughs> MXPX.com. Um, thank you guys so much for your support. Uh, this year, we're starting it off just chilling, but we got new stuff coming and, you know, new album, all that. Uh, we'll get into that later. MXPX is is busy. Don't worry. We're busy. Uh, another band that's busy. I'm going to be playing some shows this weekend, this Friday and Saturday night. Goldfinger is going to be in Berkeley at the UC Berkeley Theater. And then Saturday night in Anaheim at the House of Blues Anaheim. Um, so that's January 13th and 14th. So it's Friday the 13th in Berkeley. Ooh. Spooky. Wow. I don't know. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> we've played we've played plenty of Friday the 13th. It's going to be fine. It's going to be great, in fact. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. So come on out. There's tickets left for both shows. And you know what? Goldfinger's playing, but not just Goldfinger. Zebrahead and the Planet Smashers. What? This show is insane. This is, this is going to be amazing. This is going to be great. And uh, I'll see you guys there this weekend. All right. If you can't make it to the West Coast, I apologize. I'm sure that at some point... Goldfinger will make it to the East Coast. Um, we're just kind of kicking it off these two West Coast dates for the beginning of the year. All right, you guys, let's get to some voicemails. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you for calling in. If you guys want to call in, please call in, leave a message. You'll be on the podcast probably. And that number is 360-830-6660. It's a U.S. number centered in Kitsap County, where I am right now. Um, but it's a voicemail, so just leave a voicemail. I'll get it. I'll, uh, I'll play it here. So speaking of voicemails, let's get to it. Hey, Mike. My name's Adam McCurley. Uh, we met many, many years ago, and some of you guys were sick as a dog in Houston, Texas, so we're touring with Blenderhead. Oh, so it's been, gosh, it's been 30 years. Congratulations, man. Thank you so much for all that you've uh, done, not just in recording, but you've always been just a super nice guy whenever I had a chance to shake your hand. So I want to say thanks for that. Um, Merry Christmas. It is that time as well. So, uh, man, I remember the first time I got uh, the Christmas single that came in the mail from the fan club of Christmas Day. I still have it and still listen to it every year. So thank you so much. Um, quick question. There is a alternate order for watching Star Wars movies, as I was reading about, called the Machete Order, and it kind of made me think of something about with your career being as long and as uh, full of songs that you've written, I am curious if you could put together an order to introduce your art to someone who's never heard it before, what, what order would that be in? Where would you tell them to start? Where would you hope that they end up? Well, that's the only question I have, Mike. I sure hope you have a great new year, and uh, thank you so much for all you do, and absolutely love the podcast. Have a great day. Adam, what's up? Dude, I got a comment on that Houston show. That that show, I remember that show because we all remember that show. That was the first time MXPX has ever had serious food poisoning uh, as a band, really. I mean, we all were sick. Even Blenderhead was sick. Everybody got sick at Taco Cabana, uh the day before, or two days before, something like that. And then everybody just kind of like, like clockwork was just puking our guts out. Um, I remember that show was really, really hard. We didn't cancel, but we were, I re, Tom, Tom always tells a story. He was on stage and we're playing and we get done with a song and I'm like talking to the audience and Tom walks off the stage and pukes into a, a garbage can, comes back on stage. We resume the show. Like it was, it was intense, you know, so that was Houston. And I remember another little, little tidbit. I remember that we always talk about whenever we tell this story is being in the public bathroom at the show. This is our first tour ever, 1995, our very first tour. It was Blenderhead and us, MXPX. And it was their first tour as well. It was Blenderhead's first tour. So it was all of our first tour. And we're all sick. We're in the bathroom. A couple of us are in the bathroom. And the show 
is open. Doors are open. People are in there. So these kids start coming in, and we're just like, I'm just, uh, and Yuri, I remember Yuri is like dying. He's in in the bathroom stall puking, and so like these people are in here like, you're you're an MXPX. What's up? Uh, freaking out, <laughs> and we're just like, death, death, death. So. Everybody was sick until the next day. They started feeling better a little bit the next day, like not even the beginning of the day, like halfway through the day towards the afternoon. But that was intense. And I, I, honestly, I don't think I've had, I've had poos, f- sorry, food poisoning that bad, but we've never had it all together like that. Again, it's always been somebody got food poisoning, somebody whatever is sick. But wow, wild times, wild, wild times. But uh, as far as your question, the what order would I want to introduce people to our songs? And that's a great question, and I'm not sure I know. I hadn't really thought about this, but I would just say if it was going to be songs, um, let's say I would say Let's Ride would be the first one. Absolutely. It, the first, you know, Let's Ride. Tomorrow's another day. Um, I would say probably my life story. I'm trying to go with really MXPX sounding songs. I know we have a, a, a wide variety of, of sounds and and beats and stuff like that, but like what's like when you think of MXPX, what do you think about? Do you think chick magnet? Because Chick Magnet is absolutely one of our most well-known songs. And that's and I have no problem with people thinking of 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 MXPX or Chick Magnet when they think of MXPX. Um but we don't really have a lot of songs like Chick Magnet, you know, so it's like a kind of a an outlier when it comes to that. Um so I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Let's Ride, Tomorrow's Another Day. Secret Weapon, forgot about that one, that one's great. My Life Story. Now, so those are sort of like, it's fast, um, maybe, Can't Keep Waiting, even though it's got the ending that's a little unorthodox, it's kind of a long instrumental ending, but Can't Keep Waiting is just definitely one of my favorite songs that we've done, spanning our whole career. Um, And then, of course, you know, there might be stuff on the new album I I might put on that list, but... um, but those those are the like the the core song like the I mean there's so many songs right we have hundreds and hundreds of songs but um, I'm gonna go with Let's Ride because it's it's our era that we're in now and and I think I think Secret Weapon was sort of like our Let's Ride for the Secret Weapon era great song love that song very much speaks to me as like an MXPX sounding song um, and you know like I said tomorrow's another day. That that was a song that everybody loved when it came out, and it just it felt perfect. You know, it felt perfect. It's it's unorthodox. It's not like a, a normal pop song. It's got a weird chorus. It doesn't have a traditional sounding big chorus. Um, but I think that's okay. I think that's part of what makes certain songs stand out so much is they don't have these obvious um, song structures to them. So. Yeah, uh, I'm going to keep it at that. Uh, as far as like actual whole albums, like who would I want if you had never heard MXPX before and you were going to listen to our album for the first time? I mean, if it was right now, I would say self-titled. Listen to self-titled, then go into some of the other ones, right? Um, I mean, there's so many songs that I really love that aren't even on albums, you know? Um, Worries, one of our... our with that came out in 2020 worries um that was a, a really big song for us i feel like it, 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 for that time period of song we weren't even playing live you know but we started playing it on the on the live streams the the internet shows and that one really really has stuck it really has stuck people really really dig dig that song and that to me sounds really mxpxy um, with new elements, little elements like the guitar bits and stuff. We've always done guitar bits, but they haven't necessarily been our biggest songs, you know, songs like, uh, study humans or money tree off teenage politics, stuff like that. Um, 
you know, I think worries is is sort of the MXPX influence from that era, from that, not era, but that sound of so, that type of song, you know, song that's like really catchy, but has like a really crazy riff to it. Like, I don't want to do every song that has a crazy riff, then it's not so crazy. You know, it's kind of like, okay, I've heard that, I've heard riffs like that or whatever. So, so it's not necessarily like, we're not trying to always have the craziest riff or always have the, you know, the, the catchiest a lyric thing or whatever. Of course, it's important to have catchy lyrics, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's that's uh, man. Thanks for sticking with us for thirty years. It's been quite a ride. It's been insane, and uh, just just having the the ability to look back on all these albums and all these songs, and and have fun with just talking through them and talking about what would what would it be like to hear some of this stuff for the first time you know, and, um, yeah, I don't know. Would, would I, here's a question. Would I be a fan of MXPX if I wasn't in MXPX, if I wasn't writing the songs? I hope so because I really like what we do. So I feel like part of why MXPX sounds like it sounds is because I've taken all my influences from, you know, all the bands I've grown up listening to and all the things I've experienced and the things I like and the things I don't like. And I, and I've come up with a, a sound that I really like now part of that is probably just, Hey, you naturally have a style that you do or whatever. Like you, your voice sounds like this or your, your songwriting sounds like this. Some of that you just do naturally. You can't really, I mean, you can change it maybe, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, is I, I came to this sound that I really like. It happens to be what I naturally do. Like I, I, I really don't like to force myself to write. I don't like to force myself to write. And I like, I don't like to force myself to write something that I'm not feeling. So that goes along the same lines as I don't like to write something that I'm not thinking about or, or didn't have like, like if somebody goes, okay, you should write a song like this because it'll be really popular. People will love it that's not, that's not going to happen. Like, it's not going to come out like that, you know, like, like a good example would be like, okay, you know, there's all these songs that are like big on, on social media or whatever, little snippets. And there's this song that my kids are really into right now called Astronaut in the Ocean. And I've heard the song before they even heard it, you know, yeah, I've seen it in all the memes. I'm, it's a cool song actually. Um, astronaut in the ocean, do, 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 you know, slow motion, you know, something like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh put that stuff in slow motion there's a swear in there and and uh sailor my 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 nine-year-old daughter is always uh oh we can't say that <laughs> like it's okay just go over it or whatever you want to do you know she's real freaked out by it but um you know songs like that you know get big you know like that that's not at all what i'm thinking and, and what i'm trying to do when i'm writing i'm just literally if a if an idea pops into my noggin here into this dome and it's a melody it's a so a, a, some lyrics a line by a song or whatever i will grab that idea and i will document it or i will start writing it right now so sometimes i'm like i have the idea and i'm already busy heading to the merch arsenal heading to do something that needs to be done right now and so when that happens i just I'll write it down in my phone. I'll record a voice memo and, and I get that. And that, that's how I start writing a song. Not from, oh, I like what they're doing there. I'm going to write a song like that. No, it's, it, it might still be that somehow subconsciously. But if it comes to me subconsciously from the muse, whatever we're talking, I've talked about this so many times where I feel like there's ideas floating above me in the air and I just have to like pick them and grab them and and you have to be available you have to put in the work to concentrate on it and, and and it's not that you're just not thinking about anything and you're just pulling ideas and here's a song no you're you're thinking i'm just using that metaphor that example as something to visualize but when i'm writing i'm consciously trying to figure out what I, what it is i want to say but then there's something that happens where you just come up with an idea. It, 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 it is born in your head. It's born in your brain. 
whether or not you grabbed it from the ether and pulled it into your brain and then it becomes an idea and, it, and it's born. It's born in your brain and I just start writing lyrics and I'll write and I'll write and, and, and sometimes I'll just write one verse and I'll come back to it and I'll write the chorus or I'll write another verse and then I'll write the chorus last. But a lot of times I will write verses first all the verses so that I have, okay, this is what the dialogue is. And then the chorus for me is, okay, what is this going to distill into? Uh, I don't know if I said that right. Uh, but taking the verses and those lyrics and going, okay, this is what the song's about. And finding a chorus that really encapsulates those ideas in a much broader sense, in a much catchier sense, in a bigger chorus vibe, you know? So that's kind of how I do it. Um, but that's a great question. Uh, I, I went a little off into songwriting there, but just going back to the list, I guess, uh, let's ride. Thank you. Everybody that, that jams let's ride and plays the video. It, it literally is our biggest song of the decade. And, um, and it wasn't even, <laughs> it wasn't even put out in this decade. It was put out last decade in 2018. But, uh, isn't that wild? We're in a new decade now. Wild, just wild. All right. Thanks for the call, Adam. Let's, uh, let's see what we got next. Hey, what's up, Mike? Uh, this is Cam. I'm calling from uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, called once before, but I wanted to uh, ask a question this time. Um, so my question is, I was listening to your uh, solo um, acoustic version of Lights Out, and uh, I noticed a lot of tumble-down vibes coming from that. Uh, was that something that you did on purpose? And uh, if so, uh, are you planning on putting out any more um, like acoustic songs with that tumble-down vibe to them? Because uh, I, know, I, I know that you said at some point that, uh, that you don't know if tumble down will ever, uh, get back together. And if they, if you do, it might not be for a long time, but I love, uh, at least here in the vibe. Uh, so yeah. All right. Have a good one, man. Bye. Hey, Cam. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Um, lights out. Thanks for listening. Those that don't know, I have a, a couple songs released under my name, Mike Herrera. And one of those songs is called lights out. There's some covers I've done. It's all acoustic stuff so far. Um, Actually, no, it's not all acoustic. There's some full band stuff on my... You can just just find me. It's my name. Um, I'm a solo artist. <laughs> but yeah, Lights Out. I mean, Tumble Down was a solo project, you know, until it became a band. And and I would say Lights Out. Lights Out is just a song I wrote as a solo artist. And, and I put it together. But I guess it's got Tumble Down vibes because it is an acoustic song. And... and I always play acoustic guitar on just about every tumble down song. So I'm guessing that's why there's tumble down vibes. Uh, but like I said, it's tumble down really started out as a solo project and then became a band. And so my Carrera really is a solo project, but it also could be a band, um, you know, at some point. So, I mean, it's all, it's all like in the same pot, just swirling around, you know, and, and to be honest, I mean, there's some MXPX songs that could be tumble down songs, but it's all me writing it. So what it's like, okay, let's just put a little more twang here. Let's give it a little more traditional vocal melody. And now it's more tumble down. Um, yeah. I mean, I definitely will probably do more at some point, especially if I do solo, um, more solo songs in their acoustic that might have a, a tumble down vibe to it. Now, <clears throat> still don't have anything to anything more to add to. There's, it's very possible that we could get back together with Tumble Down and make a new record at some point, but it's not going to happen anytime soon, and it's not going to be not going to be soon, and it's not going to be probably uh, a priority as far as like, oh, let's just spend a year doing this. So, uh, but I'm not saying I wouldn't want to do it. I definitely have love for, for the project and have love for what we did and those songs and think I could add a nice third album to that someday. We'll see if we get to it before, uh, before the lights go out, right? Lights out. All right, Cam. Thanks. Hey Mike. 
Hunter from Wilmington, North Carolina. You've talked in the past about how expensive ticket prices have gotten, uh, the fees, the back end uh, that comes from some of the larger uh, concert conglomerates out there that, that, that book national acts, especially big acts that have 30 years under their belt like MXPX. Can we get a coalition of musicians that say we want a truth and ticketing price? So I know it's difficult because you want to put your stuff out there at a certain price and you know they're going to add ticket prices on top of it, but can we get people to rally for a truth and ticketing price so it's advertised that this is the final price? Because most all tickets are bought online. There's hardly any retail outlets that, that do tickets anymore for cash. It's an interesting question, I think, for your podcast. Uh, uh, I don't know if you can spearhead it on your own, but let's start a conversation about it. Truth and ticketing. Thanks, Mike. Long-time listener. Love the podcast. Love MX. See it. Later. Hey, Hunter. Yeah, truth in ticketing. What brings what that brings up to my mind is Pearl Jam from, what was it? late 90s, somewhere in there. Pearl Jam fought Ticketmaster, tried to destroy them pretty much, tried to not use them, didn't use them for many years, and finally, they're back to using them. So, I mean, it's like Ticketmaster is one of two or three of the biggest companies in the music business, and not just the music business, they in any kind of event business, right? So it's more, it's bigger than even music. It's, it's sporting events, you know, you, wrestling, WWE, UFC, all these fighting arena, you know, events. So not just sports, not just ticketing, or sorry, not just music and sports, but also probably what else is there? There's like tickets to go see people, like comedy show, I guess it's music. I mean, it's entertainment. Basically, they just rule the whole entertainment market. Now, truth and ticketing, that seems like a great idea. I'm sure that it's much more complicated than that because there are different pieces of tickets. So there's, there's you know, so many different deals you can do where you might get a certain percentage of the ticket price and then you also get, um, I don't know. I don't know if people get like a percentage of the fees. I don't think bands get fees, but it's possible that that you get part of your your money from the ticket and then you get like a little tiny bit of it from the fee. I don't actually know the answer to that question. I'm sure uh, Tom Chichilla would. If he was here, he could help me out. Um, I guess what I'm saying is it's a huge battle. It's uphill battle that is not going to be easy for anyone. Does, does that mean I'm like, no way, I'm not going to try? No, it doesn't mean I'm not going to try. It, it just means that it's like, whoa, okay, uh, I think, I think a side, not a side, but on top of ticketing being ridiculous, there's so many issues that we have going on in this country. And if we want to keep it just in the music business and the live business, ticket fees are, are definitely one of the main situations. But aside from ticket fees, what about secondary market? The fact that some of the best seats in the house at a concert that just goes on sale day of, you can't even get right when it goes on sale because those are already, that inventory is already kept put aside for the secondary market because they know they can mark this ticket up two times, three times the base price. So there's a lot going on, not just not just the fees, but the secondary market. Um, StubHub, that was a big thing. Now StubHub is owned by Ticketmaster, pretty sure. Pretty sure they're owned by Ticketmaster, which you got to go, wait, Ticketmaster is selling tickets to people, but then those people buy the Ticketmaster tickets and then they can't go to the show. So they put that up on for resale on StubHub, but Ticketmaster gets the fees from that first ticket and the whatever percentage they get off each ticket and the secondary market, they get the fees and most of the stuff off of that too, because they own StubHub. 
So you see, it's it's a it's a it's a business. It's a money making business, and and I would say there's probably more caveats. But the third thing that makes this very complicated is is not everybody cares as much as you do, Hunter. Uh, I care. I absolutely care, and don't want our fans paying double the price or or maybe twenty five percent more on the top of the price of the ticket. I don't like that ever. Never have. Never will. Um, but there's a lot of showgoers. They're like, they go to one or two shows a year and it's usually a big concert and they're going to go to Taylor Swift or whatever. And Billie Eilish, whatever. So they don't care. They just want the ticket. And if they have to pay more to get it, they'll pay more. Cause it's like, I paid this much more. Can you believe it? It's crazy. It's like a story to tell. So there's people that just don't I'm not saying they don't care because they would rather pay more, but they just don't really think about it that much. They're just like, just give me the convenience. Let's go. And I think that's why StubHub, Ticketmaster, that's why they do so well. It's because there's a big contingency, a big percentage of the population that's buying these concert tickets, these live event tickets that just don't care. They're just they're just sort of the the cattle of the industry. And people like you, Hunter, that go to a lot of shows, that pay attention to what's going on, and they can see that, you know, bands aren't getting paid all the money that you're that it's going to the, the ticket. And not that bands should get all of the ticket money. It should be a fair percentage, depending on, you know, the work done, the work being done. But but yeah, just not everybody cares about it. So yeah, it's a it's a <sighs> It's a tough one, and I'm down to keep that dialogue open, um, but I don't know. I, I do know Tom Chichilla has some ideas, but it's just such a crazy uphill battle. Like I said, um, we try to just, like, figure something out and work on that thing. And so when it comes to ticketing fees, you know, we might work on on getting a couple shows really low, that kind of thing. And so that's where where we can make a difference, is making a difference in people's lives right now. It's not going to be every single show because certain shows we do are just kind of like, can you do the show? Yes or no. There's no negotiating. You just, you're in or out. And, and so a show like uh, When We Were Young, that's coming up in October of this year in Vegas. That's a festival. It's got a ton of bands on it. That was... I mean, it's a good deal for us, definitely, but that was just like, take it or leave it. And we're like, okay, can we, yeah, let's do this. Let's do the show. So we, we took it, but, and, and I'm not saying we took a bad deal because we didn't, we took a great deal, but there's just not a lot of, sometimes you can't negotiate and sometimes you can. And when we can, which is usually our own shows um, a little bit more, you still can't get no fees. I mean, that doesn't exist as right now in the corporate world of ticketing events. So, but you can, you can make the fee lesser. You can, you can bump it down a little bit. So, I mean, a, a band like MXPX will have probably, and I haven't done the math on this, but I would assume we're trying to get our, our ticket fees less than, than like, you know, your, like a big show you would go to like a, like a Taylor Swift, like I said, like a big arena show or something. But, um, it's a mess. It really is. And and I and I can't say that I'm an expert on it because I'm not. So you guys just all listen to me blab about tickets for <laughs> however many five to ten minutes. All right, let's let's move on. Um, you know, if you have any thoughts on that, Hunter, please call back in and we'll continue the dialogue on the podcast. It would be cool. Um, but that's all I got for now. We'll we'll see what what happens. Hey, Mike. This is Ryan calling from Lacol, Quebec. I saw you guys in St. Therese on September 17th, which was the first time I saw you guys live since the 2000 Vans Warped Tour, and it was absolutely amazing. But anyway, my question is, I was scrolling on YouTube today, and I found a video from 2015 of you playing with the MXPX All-Stars, you know, back when Tom and Yuri weren't playing in the band live. And I wanted to ask, respectfully, as a sincerely curious fan uh what were those times like were you guys on good terms and how did they feel when you were keeping up the mxpx live show when they weren't able to be part of it um i gotta imagine you know maybe it was a weird time for you, you being on the road you know keeping the lights on 
when it seems like maybe MXPX at that time was start, starting to feel like maybe it was slowing down. I know Tom and Yuri went and they got uh, regular quote-unquote jobs for a while. But, you know, obviously, thankfully, everything is coming back around these days since your last album. You guys have been killing it. And it makes me so happy to see that you guys look happy. You have, looks like you're having fun. You guys are doing your shows mainly on the weekends. And I feel like it seems like you guys found the perfect work-life balance now as a band. And you guys just are better than ever. So it's a happy ending. But, yeah, about that time in between when it was slowing down, I wonder, how was it, man? Thanks for all the music. See ya. Ryan, great question. Yeah, so there was a couple years um, where I think MXPX with Tom and Yuri, we didn't play... We didn't play a show for like at least two years, maybe two years together. But the band never really broke up. Like it was weird. It was, I, I will admit it was weird. Um, but the, it was so around, around 2009, I mean, the, the, the economy was in the crapper. There was a recession happening. People were losing their houses and, uh, music was not doing good because Napster was kind of taken over and you know, th those were the, those times. Right. And at no time were Tom and Yuri and I ever enemies or mad at each other. I mean, I'm sure they, I don't know. I'm sure they've been mad at me at some point, but I wish they were here to, to, to attest to this, but it was more like we've talked, I've talked to them about this, later, a few years ago, we talked about it. And it was from their perspective, it was more like, oh, we could just, you know, you were doing what you had to do to survive. And we didn't know at the time if we were going to come back to the band, you know, like, is this going to fizzle out, you know? And so they were kind of doing what they had to do to survive. And I was doing what I had to do to survive. Now, when, when I started the, the, the all-stars came out of necessity. Um, it really wasn't planned out that way. It was MXPX had a, a tour booked in Japan and Asia, uh, like Indonesia and all that. And, and it was um, November, December, some, I don't know what the year was, probably like 2009, some 2009, 2010, somewhere in there. And I could be wrong. It could, yeah, I'm just trying to remember back, forget, you know, be patient, everybody. Um, we had this tour booked and I was like, what are we going to do with this tours booked? And then Tom and Yuri both got jobs that they were waiting on and still doing MXP stuff. But like, if we get this opportunity to do this job, I'm going to be busy. And it's just kind of like, wow, okay. And sure enough, it happened. They couldn't do the tour. And I was like, should I do the tour? Tommy Rat was our tour manager and manager at the time. And we basically, I was like, I'm going to call Chris Rowe. And I called Chris Rowe. I was like, hey, do you want to, you come play with me and, and do, do this thing? And so Chris Rowe from the Ataris and then Chris Wilson, um, the ex-drummer of Good Charlotte, he, uh, he was down to do it. And I'm good friends with Chris. So he was awesome. And so we, we did the, the all-stars and, and then that morphed into like getting a European band for European tours. And, and that came about because I was doing solo and touring in Europe and, and, um, and it was great. I mean, it was great. Also hard. It was really hard. And, and it wasn't always, it wasn't always the best thing to be doing, I will admit, but it really, really kept us afloat and it made MXP stronger as we are. Like it made us strong today. And I don't feel like we could, I mean, sure, we could have not done anything in those times and then, and then come back and maybe been big or whatever. But the way we did it was just because I had bills to pay and I had to tour and, you know, write songs. And I was doing Tumble Down at the same time. Tumble Down started in 2007. I was also trying to do this Monkey Trent studio. I, I started the studio and I was trying to take clients and be a producer. And I did that for years. And, um, I did it, but did it ever break through like MXPX did? You know, no, not really. I mean, I, th I feel like it was just, it kept me afloat while MXPX got back on our feet. And, and sometimes it just takes a little time. Sometimes you need life's crazy changes to go through those changes and then come out the other side. And 
yeah, that's basically what we did. So, so, uh, all stars. Yeah. I don't know what your exact question was. I don't remember. It was, was it like, do I regret it or, or just talk about it? But, um, to me, it, the MXPX all stars was, uh, was a lifesaver. You know, it was, um, a little bit of a rescue mission because we were in trouble. We were in trouble of one. I feel like the brokest I've been money wise was, <laughs> was probably around 2000, 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. Like after I had spent a bunch of money on this studio and, and, uh, the money wasn't really necessarily coming back very quickly or at all. Um, I made peanuts on tours, but I, you know, but we did make enough to take money home and to pay the guys and pay, pay my tumble down guys. And, but nobody was making a ton of money back then. You know, I was living off of savings here and there and we were, uh, I just started a family. It was crazy. You know, it was crazy. We, I might, no, that was 2013. I didn't have a kid till 2013, but still, I mean, that's, that's a whole nother little era of life that was like a couple years long that was a wild time. Um, yeah, you know, the all-stars really just long story short, kept us afloat and kept interest up and, and filled demand where there was demand so we could kind of get back on our feet. And, um, you know, we, we made it happen. So as far as I'm concerned, all those things really strengthened us as a band and as, as, uh, friends, Tom and Yuri and I, and, um, we're, better than ever now, you know, we don't, Tom and I hang out, not quite a bit, we'll, we'll hang out a bit, and Yuri is, just has a different schedule, so he can't necessarily hang out in free time as much, but we, I mean, we all get along, Yuri gets along with, gets along with everybody, I mean, Yuri's great, and um, I feel the most comfortable with Tom and Yuri, you know, and my wife, maybe, <laughs> it's between my wife, my kids, and Tom and Yuri, but, uh, and my parents, and I've spent a lot of time with them, but like, I'm just thinking about like humans that you are very comfortable being around <laughs> those guys for sure. Uh, always will love those guys. And, uh, I'm just ecstatic with how it's come out the other side. It really has been amazing. And now we have 2023, a new record that we're, we're working on and, and almost done with. And geez, just, I can't wait. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. And I can't wait for you guys to just continue with. I can't wait for MXPX to continue doing what we're doing. And that's it. So thank you guys for the, your support. I'm going to take one more voicemail. All right. You guys have been great. Oh, did I tell you? Yeah, I think I mentioned this week, Goldfinger. Hey, Mike, this is Jason in Glendale, Arizona. Um, saw you guys um, at the Tempe, Arizona show back in April at the Marquee Theater, which is awesome. Um, about the 30th anniversary uh, zip up hoodie and uh, also the show poster as well. Um, I did see the Burmerton Originals hoodie on the uh, March Arsenal. Um, I told my girlfriend about it uh, for a birthday gift, but uh, she waited too long and it sold out pretty quickly. Um, hopefully that comes back in stock soon because that, uh, that hoodie looks killer. Um, speaking of merch, um, I recently ordered the uh, Color Splatter vinyl version of the Ever, pa Ever Passing Moment, which is actually the album that first got me into you guys, but um, somehow I accidentally uh, put the shipping info for a former address, so I had to email in and explain my situation and try to get the address changed before it shipped. Uh, Michelle Herrera helped me out. Um, I believe you said that your mom runs the merch arsenal for you guys, so if uh, Michelle is your mom, um, it's kind of cool to have been able to work with your mom. Um, uh, but um, she was awesome and got the address corrected for me, and um got the uh the album here so it's uh it's awesome so thank you for that uh and thank her for that uh as well um i, I do want to say that being a long time listener of the podcast and a uh, long time mxpx fan um i feel like the listeners and fans are able to kind of get to know you on a slightly personal level which is cool since you don't often get that from most quote-unquote rock stars uh, like i remember a little while back you had a video on facebook that showed you how you make a breakfast burrito or something like that. Uh, something like that's kind of something you'd see, you know, maybe on FaceTime with a family member or something like that. So it's kind of cool in a weird way to have a friend, quote unquote, uh, uh, that just happens to be the kick-ass uh, punk rock band. Um, I don't know. Hopefully that doesn't sound too stalkerish. Um, 
I did actually get to meet you one time in Vegas after um, what was supposed to be Yuri's retirement show at Kerry Hart's old club at the Hard Rock uh, um, Hotel. Um, I think it's called Night Wasted Space. Um, Wasted show Space. With, uh, I've actually have a funny uh, story on that. I went to the show with uh, my now ex-wife and her cousin who was a massage therapist. And while talking to Yuri, the cousin offered to go back to um, Yuri's room and give him a massage, uh, which Murray, uh, Yuri uh, politely uh, turned down. Uh, but it's super weird and embarrassing for me because as a drummer myself, I was kind of geeking out on uh, um, meeting Yuri. But um, my uh, ex cousin's a bit, a, a bit of a hussy, so to speak, so should have been uh, too uh, surprised on that. Uh, but um, I do want to say that you guys, uh, you, Tom, and Yuri, were uh, super cool and very personal. So I'm confident that how you are on the podcast is um, 100% genuine. And so thanks for being so awesome. Um, my question for you is um, – that I wanted to ask if when you guys are out on tour through the years, do you guys ever get time to see any of the sites of the places you go to? Um, I'm sure in the early days, at least, when you guys were, you know. Oh, it got cut off. Three-minute limit. Uh, but but I think I get the gist of what you're saying. Do you ever get to go and see things on tour? Now, let me, let me, let me uh, just go back to some of your comments. Uh, yes, we will have new stock of the... Um, Bremerton Originals hoodie. I think that's the one you're talking about. And we try to, you know, we have a few things in the store that are like staple items. Um, the classic punk head hoodie, the, the, the Bremerton hoodie. Um, those do sell out quite a bit and we're just always having to reorder more sizes and, and things like that. So yeah, stay tuned and, and look back in a little bit. Thank you for supporting us with our, our vinyl reissues. Um, those are still selling, by the way. We still have um, we still have a little bit of stock, quite a bit of stock. Um, most of it sold out already, but the beauty is, is we just ordered so much of it that we, we still have some. So anybody who wants to get it, go get it at mxpx.com. Um, that's most of the orders that we, we send out these days are, are vinyl, which is great for me because I'm a pro. I am just... I know exactly how to do it up. Do, do, do. There was a learning curve at first, but uh, we got it. Um, what else did you? Oh, my mom. My mom is Michelle. Yes, you talked to my mom. She runs runs the merch arsenal, and I work with her closely on that. And um, she does a great job. And shout out to my mom, Michelle. What's up? Um, she does clean my room. Not lately, but she she used to clean my room. And um, if you consider the merch arsenal is kind of my room, even though I don't own that building, my parents do, but I still still kind of live in at my parents when it comes to MXPX. Like our merch office warehouse is at my parents' house. Now it used to be separate, but we sold that house and brought it in-house. It just made more sense all around. But um, thank you for your support and thanks for supporting the mom and pop shops. Appreciate you. Now, Wasted Space, that was a great show. I remember that show. I remember after that show, everybody else was wasted, and I hadn't been drinking the whole show. And so I was like, I'm going to catch up. And I just grabbed, like, a bottle of vodka and started drinking it. I got pretty drunk that night. Let's let's just put it that way. Probably a little too drunk because the next day I was very hungover. Did not feel good at all. Do not recommend. Um, but... That was a fun show and, and everybody had a good time and, and you know, it's funny, you know, we'll have to, next time we, we break up, we'll have to do another, another show like that for Yuri. <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad Yuri didn't, didn't, uh, didn't call it quits for good. You know, he eventually came back. Um, but do we see, do we get to see sites on tour? Do we get to go see places? Yes and no. It really just des- depends on the schedule. It depends on what you're touring in. If you're touring in a van and you're driving it yourself, you can go see things on the way if you schedule it and you really, really want to. Now, if you're in a bus, tour bus, you're usually driving at night, so you don't really see much. You just see when you wake up, you're in a city on the curb, parked, usually right outside a venue, and so mostly what you see is you see at night, you see dark traffic. You see the road and lights and you're going down the freeway and there's traffic and, and whatever. But um, usually because of that, you know, we'll go, 
in the city will go out and do something. We'll go out and see something. So if we're in Chicago, we might go out and see the the silver bean, the big bean. Or is it a, I think it's a bean. You know, something like that. We'll go, you know, we don't usually have time to go see like a sporting event. That takes too long. Although after Warp Tour one year in Cleveland, um, me and a crew member, I don't remember which guy it was with us, but we went and saw the Cleveland Indians play baseball because it was we played it kind of early that day and the, the game was starting at like three or something and we we're like, we're done and I don't have any signing right now, so let's go see the game. And we went and we watched the nodes bleeds and that was so amazing, so cool to just be outside the Warp Tour the Warp Tour uh, scene for a little while. Um, something I've made it made it a point to do is if I'm in a really cool place like Tokyo, Japan, or a lot of a lot of places in Europe, um, different cities, Paris, France, things like that, I'll make a point to go out and see something. But if I'm in Scranton, PA, uh, I might go see the office offices, but I bet they don't even film that in Scranton, right? Like so, so. Nah, more more just like the big stuff. I, I really pay attention to the big stuff. And if uh, something I really enjoyed a couple years ago, I toured with, um, I did a solo. Well, no, it was also, it was back in the All-Stars days. So this was quite a while ago. Um, I toured, we toured with Zebrahead in Europe. And they're, they do really well in Germany, especially, but all over Europe. And we had a blast with them. And I just made it a point to, if they were going out to, to go sightseeing, and they invited me to come, I would go. And it really, it really made a big difference in just is so much more that I'd seen after that tour. Um, and then also just getting to hang with the Zebrahead guys, becoming really good friends with them and, and spending free time outside the show with them was great. So all of those things are, are definitely things I try to do. Cause you never know when you're going to go back to a country or back to a city. And for me being in, in a band that's who knows, you know, I, I, we've toured all over, but you just never know what's going to happen. So I always assume if we're here, this is our last time here. It's our last time until we get lucky enough to come back again. But I always kind of just assume that we may never be back in the city to play a show. And in that, in that instance, you know, I go, okay, well, if I'm going to be here, this is my last time here. What, what am I missing? What should I check out? What should I do? And that's kind of how I run my life in general is, is I do that. I try to take a good inventory and look around at my surroundings and, and what's going on and, and really just take a snapshot in my memory of, of where I'm at. So I love it. Great question. I mean, I, I, you know, Vegas, whew, we'll be back later this year. Um, I know MXPX hasn't really announced any shows yet, but we're kind of waiting to get all our, our stuff together and we're still working on stuff. But uh, yeah, I just, I'm just grateful that, that you guys listen to this podcast and that you call me in with questions and, and, and it really kind of brings back some memories that I hadn't thought about in a long time. So uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for, for supporting MXPX and what we do and what we've failed at so many times, but we, uh, we're just trying to do good, trying to make a good record and, and trying to play good when we, when we play live, like you said, we look like we're having fun and, and all that. And yes, uh, <laughs> we had a great time in Quebec. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. We, uh, we did, what was it? Okay. That was the last color that we was in Quebec, but, but just the fact that you mentioned that, it looks like we're having fun when we play live. Well, we are. We Every now and then some disaster will happen where it's not fun. But even then, it's kind of still fun, honestly. Like, it, it is what it is. You know, you just, you just because we were a punk band, we don't have our, our everything programmed the way it's supposed to be every single night. Like, things will happen at a show. And Goldfinger is another good example of that. Goldfinger is crazy. Things happen all the time. And uh, somebody will mess up. We'll, you know, I've, I'll fall off the stage, whatever it is. So, yeah. Uh, appreciate you guys. Thanks for listening. Um, shout out to Bob McKnight, my producer. 
he uh, he has a podcast called the Bob and Katie Show. So shout out to Katie as well. Um, all right, you guys, mxpx.com, Goldfinger this Friday and Saturday, Friday in Berkeley, Saturday in Anaheim, California. Um, tickets available, go get them. Um, come see me there, see us there, all that. Would love to see you guys. Um, I'm going to do my best to just get down with the bass line, the funky, funky bass lines. It's going to be good. I've been practicing a bit this last week, and I'll be practicing all this week, this coming week, uh, heading into it. All right. More soon, more soon. But until then, you guys have a great week, great month. Much love. Peace out.